All right, class, today we're going to cover chapter eight, which is about sample um, populations. So first thing we're going to do in this video is just cover section 8.1, which is about sampling distributions. And there are two different types of sampling distributions we're going to look at. Distribution of sample means and distribution of sample proportions. The first thing I want us to do is go over the central limit theorem again. This is a concept we covered right at the end of um, chapter six. So remember for the central limit theorem, if we have a population, right, we're gonna define a population parameter. And that could be our mean, the standard deviation, mode, or even a percentage or proportion, hint, hint, of a population with a specific characteristic, okay? But we can't sample the whole population. That would be a census, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a simple random sample from this population and calculate a sample statistic, okay? We will use this sample statistic to estimate a population parameter, right? However, here's the problem. Every time we take a new sample, that statistic may change. If I was, say, to take the average height of each of my classes, in order to determine the average height of the average um, college level course, each of my courses would have a different statistic and that's gonna be different from our true population. So a big question we're gonna focus on is how do I best approximate my population mean? And for that, we're gonna need the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem states that if you keep drawing larger and larger samples and calculating their means, the graph of our sample will form a normal distribution, right? That's what we want. We want a normal distribution because we can work with that. The area under a normal distribution is one. We can use a Z table to determine the area under our normal distribution. As our, graph, as our sample sizes get bigger and bigger, that's when my graph approaches a normal distribution, okay? And the mean of this normal distribution approaches our true population mean. So the central limit theorem allows us to say something about the mean of a population if we know, uh, sorry, the mean of a group, so a sample, if we know the mean of the population and the standard deviation, sigma, of the entire population. So we're gonna look at sampling distributions. Sampling distributions are when we're taking samples of groups of means and we can look at the population mean or population proportion, okay? And just as a little bit more of a refresher, this is when our standard deviation changes to, um, we represent it with an S now and our standard deviation is gonna be, uh, for population means, sigma over the square root of n, right? My standard deviation gets smaller as my population gets bigger. So we're gonna use the central limit theorem to determine population means or proportions. So let's consider the following statements and why don't you tell me whether they're gonna be a population mean or a population proportion. So our first question is the mean daily protein consumption of Americans is 67 grams, okay? So this is definitely gonna use a population mean. For our second statement, nationwide, the mean hospital stay, Bobby, it's okay, that's my cat. <laughs> the mean hospital stay after delivery of a baby decreased from 3.2 days in 1990 to the current mean of two days. That's definitely gonna be a population mean, right? That's why I'm drawing this symbol. Remember, that's mu. Let's take a look at uh, statement three. 30% of high school girls in this country believe they would be happy if they got married. That is a percentage, so that's gonna be a proportion. I'm gonna go ahead and represent that with a P. In statement four, about 5% of all American children live with a grandparent. That is gonna be a proportion. Proportions use percentages. 
So the first thing I want to take a look at is sample means because this is something we've seen before. So let's consider a family with three children, age four, five, and nine, okay? And let's pretend these three children represent the entire population for our study. This is really similar to the example where our population was the numbers one, two, and three. Remember I brought paper plates to class, it was very exciting. So children age four, five, and nine, that's our new population, okay? And I wanna figure out what's the mean age for these three children. So I would take four plus five plus nine and divide that by three. So what's that gonna be? And our mean age would be six. So this is our population mean. So let's take a look if we took samples of size one. The smallest possible sample size we can take is one. That's always gonna be true. And there are three possible samples we could have. The four-year-old, the five-year-old, or the nine-year-old, okay? So here is our sample, our sample means and a graph of our sample means. Since our sample size was only one, our true population mean isn't even represented on the, in this graph. Remember, we've got our sample mean and the frequency that occurs. So now what if we take a look at samples that are a little bit bigger? How about two? So a sampling distribution is the distribution of any sample statistic from all possible samples of a particular size. So in the previous slide, we saw a sampling distribution of size one. The distribution of sample means is going to be the histogram created with the sample means on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis. So let's take a look at uh, when we take a sample of size two, okay? How many possible samples could we have out of um, our three children? Well, it's important to say that it's with replacement, right? So that means if I pick the four-year-old, I can pick the four-year-old again. So I'm gonna have nine possible samples. So this is our sample uh, in here. So these are our samples, right? I have the four and the four-year-old, four, five, four, nine, five, four, and so on. And what I did was I calculated the sample mean for each of my nine samples. Then what I wanna do is I wanna make a distribution of the sample means, so I'm gonna calculate their frequency. So four occurs just once, 4.5 occurs twice, five occurs once, 6.5 occurs twice, here and here. Seven occurs twice, and nine occurs once. So all of our samples are represented. Now I go ahead and graph this frequency distribution. But look, still our true population mean is not represented on this graph. So what is the mean of our sample means, okay? And what is happening to the distribution of my sample means as we take bigger and bigger sample sizes? Something to keep in mind. So let's say I took my sample of three children and I picked sample sizes of size 10, okay? And I'm gonna pick samples of size 10 and I'm gonna take 1,000 random samples from my children ages four, five, and nine. As we can see, the bigger our samples get, our graph approaches a normal distribution, and now our population mean is truly represented. So in most cases, right, populations are huge, and so we cannot survey every person in the population but it's also true that we rarely know the true population mean, right? This would come from sampling everybody in the population.
So instead what we're going to use is we're going to use the sample mean to estimate the mean of our entire population. Okay? We use this one value from our sample to estimate the mean of an entire population. Although a sample is a lot easier to work with, it's possible that it doesn't represent the population exactly. Remember, there are lots of different ways to pick a sample. We're going to assume we're picking a simple random sample, right? But it could be the case that that is not a sample that represents the population perfectly. The error that is introduced in working with a sample is called the sampling error. And this is always going to be a factor. So sampling error is the error introduced because a random sample is used to estimate a population mean or parameter, okay? This is important to note that it doesn't include other sources of error we've talked about before, such as bias sampling, bad survey questions, or um, data recording mistakes. Remember, bad survey questions are questions that have a negative or, con a negative or positive connotation. I believe the example I used in class was, hey, would you like a tax cut? And everyone was like, oh yeah, we would love to pay less in taxes. But the bad thing is, what if you're paying less in taxes, but um, then you have to pay more uh, for local um, nonprofits, more to your city government, right? Because they're slashing funding. So something to keep in mind, bad survey questions. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this next example. So here are results from a survey of students who are asked how many hours they spend per week using a search engine on the internet, okay? And their times are listed below. So how much time they spend using a search engine. So I sampled 400 people. We found that our true population, if this 400 students is our population, right, is, um, 3.88 hours with a standard deviation of 2.4, okay? So we're considering these 400 people our population. Now, let's say I select a sample of 32 students from the 400 values on the previous slide. So here are my new sample of 32 students. The mean of this sample is 4.17, okay? And we're going to use x bar to denote our sample mean. Okay, that's what we're going to use. So this is the mean of my sample, where mu is the mean of our population. And I'm just going to write pop for that. So we say that x bar is a sample statistic because it comes from the sample of an entire population. Thus x bar is our sample mean as I had said before. So here's some important notation for us to use. So little n here is gonna denote the size of our sample. So in this example, our sample was size 32. Big N denotes the sample of our population. That would be the 400 students I surveyed about the time they spend using a search engine. X bar is our sample mean. Mu is our population mean. Sigma is our standard deviation for our population. And S is the sample standard deviation. So be sure you um, know the notation as to make sure you don't get yourself confused and you can solve um, the upcoming equations properly. So now let's suppose I take a second sample of size 32 from my 400 students. This sample mean is 3.98. Our first sample mean we found was 4.17 and the true population mean is 3.88. So this mean is closer, but still not quite perfect. Now this figure below shows if I took 100 different samples of size 32 and this histogram, notice it looks really close to a normal um, distribution. I'm gonna try and draw a normal distribution on here. Ooh, so close, right? Here it is a normal distribution and our population mean is right about 3.88, okay? So as we take more and more samples of a big size, 
right? We're going to approach a normal distribution. So if we were to include all possible samples of size 32, so not just 100, this would be thousands, the distribution of the sample means would approximate a normal distribution. So instead of, in this previous example, where it looks really, really close to a normal distribution, if we took all possible samples, this would be a normal distribution. The mean of the distribution of sample means, right, because we're graphing all the means, is going to be the mean of the population. And the population standard deviation was 2.4. The sample size we had was 32. What's the standard deviation of sample means? We've talked about this before. This is where my standard deviation becomes sigma divided by the square root of n. Sigma divided by the square root of n is our new standard deviation. So, as I said in the previous slide, the larger the sample, the distribution of sample means approximates a normal distribution. The mean of the distribution of sample means equals the population mean, and the standard deviation is this new expression right here where we take sigma divided by the square root of n. So as our sample sizes get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, this is gonna get smaller and smaller. So, technical note, what I want us to do is make sure we're going to assume the distribution of sample means is close to normal if the sample size is greater than 30, okay? You're always going to want a sample size greater than 30. We saw um, in the example with the kids aged 4, 5, and 9 that taking samples of size 1 and then size 2 and then size 10 didn't really give us quite the perfect um, approximation of a normal distribution we would like to have. And again, we want to get a normal distribution because there's so much information that we can learn and interpret from the normal curve and values along the normal curve. So now we've got a new z-score for sample means because we have a new standard deviation, okay? So my z-value is going to be my sample mean minus our population mean over our new standard deviation which is sigma divided by the square root of n. Be really, really careful when plugging this into your calculators, okay? You have to keep track of PEMDAS. It is really necessary. Remember, PEMDAS is parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. If you have a graphing calculator, Put some parentheses in there. It's going to save you a lot of trouble and a lot of accidental errors. So let's take one more sample, random sample of 32 students and the time they spend on a search engine per week. Here our sample mean is 5.01. Okay. So given that, Given that our population mean is 3.88 what, and that the standard deviation is 2.4, what is the z-score of the sample mean of 5.01? So I'm going to have to calculate a z-score. My z-score is my sample mean minus our population mean over our standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So this gives me 5.01, that's my x bar. And this is how typically you'll hear me say this. This is said x bar. <clears throat> 5.01 minus 3.88 over 2.4 divided by the square root of 32. That's going to give us 2.66. So I go and look this up in my Z table, and that gives me a value of 0.9961. Remember, we're saying that this forms a normal distribution. So here's my normal distribution. 
Here's our sample mean, which is 3.88. And I've got, sorry, that's our population mean. And our sample mean of 5.01 would be right here. So when I look up a value in the Z table, it's telling me the area to the left of 5.01. That's 0.9961. So when I say, what is the probability of selecting another sample with a sample mean less than 5.01, so this whole area over here, we would say 99.6%. Be careful not to round it to 100% because there's still a little bit of something over here in this tail, but 99.6%. Let's work through, through a couple more examples of these. Okay, class, so in this example, we see that Texas has roughly 225,000 farms, which is more than any other state in the United States. Good to know. The actual mean farm size is 582 acres, and the standard deviation is 150 acres. So if I'm going to take samples of 100 farms, I want to find the mean and the standard deviation for this distribution of sample means. Well, because I'm taking a sample size greater than 30, I know this is, I know this is gonna form a normal distribution. And it's a normal distribution where the mean is going to be the true population mean. What changes here is our standard deviation. The new way we calculate standard deviation is going to be sigma over the square root of n. Sigma in this case is 150. And the square root of n is going to be the square root of 100. So I'm going to get 150 divided by 10, which is going to be 15. Next, I want to know what is the probability of selecting a farm sorry, a sample of 100 farms with a sample mean greater than 600 acres. So we're gonna have to find a z-score, right? My mean is 582. My standard deviation, my new standard deviation is, we said it was 15. So let's go ahead and calculate our z-score. That's gonna be my sample mean, 600 minus 582 over 15. That's going to give me 18 divided by 15, which is 1.2. So then I go to my z table and I find the area to the left of 600. So I go to 1.2 and that's going to be 0.88. But this question is asking, what's the probability of selecting a random sample of farms with a sample mean greater than 600 acres? So I'm trying to find this area over here. Well, that's going to be 0.215, or we could just round up to 22%. All right, class, now we're going to talk about distributions of sample proportions. Before we were looking at the distribution of sample means, now we're going to be looking at the distribution of sample proportions. So when you're not given a population mean and you're given a population proportion, that proportion becomes your mean. So let's say we surveyed 400 students and they were asked whether or not they own a car and 240 replied that they did. So I want to know what's the exact population proportion of car owners, okay? I'm going to represent this with a P. So that's going to be 240 divided by 400. That gives me 0.6, or six, that's representative of 60%. But now we're going to want to keep things in decimal form, and you'll see why in a minute. The population proportion right here, this 0.6, is the example of our population mean.
So let's say from these 400 students, I randomly draw 32 responses, okay, from my list of yes or no's, and I wanna know what's the sample proportion of yes responses in this sample. So that's gonna be P hat, that's how I say it, P hat, it looks like it's wearing a little triangle on top, and that's gonna be 21 divided by 32, which gives us 0.656. This is close to our true population proportion of 0.6, but not quite. This is an example of a sample statistic. So in this case, we're gonna call it a sample proportion because it's a proportion of, proportion of car owners within a sample. And we're gonna use the symbol P hat, like I said, to distinguish the sample proportion, P hat, from our population proportion, P. So here's our notation for working with sample proportions. Again, sample size is represented with an N, so here we had a sample size of 32, but a population proportion, sorry, a population size of 400. In this last example, we found a sample proportion of 0.656, while our population proportion was 0.6. Here's one thing that's different. So, for the distribution of sample proportions, okay, we find p hat for all possible samples of a given size, just like what the distribution of sample means. When I take larger and larger sample sizes, they approximate a normal distribution. The mean of my normal distribution is going to be the population proportion, where before it was the population mean. This is the big difference. This is our um, new way we calculate the standard deviation. Okay, So we're going to take P times 1 minus P divided by N, and that's why it's really important that P must be A decimal. P must be a decimal. So let's work through a couple examples of this. So here's how we're going to calculate our z-score. We're going to take our population, our, our sample proportion minus our population proportion over the square root of our population proportion times one minus our population proportion over the square root again of n. Again, being really careful with PEMDAS, right? Our order of operations is really important. So let's look at another sample of 32 responses. I got 24 yeses and eight noes. And remember this is how many students said they own a car. The sample proportion for this sample is going to be P hat, which is 24 over 32, that's going to give me a 0.75. And let's remember that our true population proportion is 0.6. So how far does it, being P hat, lie from the mean of our distribution? Well, 0.75 is 0.15 away from my mean, and I found that by taking, remember this is a proportion, so I should have used a P, sorry guys. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take P hat minus P, and that's gonna tell me how far away my population, my sample proportion is from my population proportion. And that's gonna give me 0.15. Now, let's say we're sticking with this same sample. Our population proportion is 0.6. Our sample proportion was 0.75. And I want to know what's the probability of selecting another sample with a sample proportion greater than the one you selected. Remember, we're doing a distribution of sample means. Sorry, sample proportions. So I want to know What's the probability of selecting a sample with a proportion greater than the one I selected? So I'm trying to find this area over here. So I need to calculate a z-score. 
My new z score is going to be z equals p hat minus p over the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. I know the difference between p hat and 0.6 is 0 0.15. I'm going to take 0.15 over the square root of 0.6 times 1 minus 0.6 over 32. So you can make sure you're punching this into your calculators, right? That gives you 0.15 over 0 0.087. So I get a z-score of 1.72. This is supposed to be a 7. I go ahead and look this up in my fancy Z table and I find that the area over here to the left of 0.75 is 0.9573. So in order to figure out the area over here, I need to subtract from 1, right? Because the total area under a normal curve is 1. So if I take 1 minus 0.9573, I get 0 0.0427. So, what's the probability of selecting another sample with a proportion greater than the one I selected? That's going to be right about 4%. All right, one more example for all of us. So, Let's suppose that 40% of all 500 students at a school said they liked chocolate ice cream. I have no idea why this isn't 100%. Ice cream's delicious. Maybe someone's lactose intolerant. Who knows? Sorry. Um, so let's say I take a, sample ran a, a random sample of 45 students from all of my total 500 students. So this is my P, right? And I find that of these 45 students, 29 of them say they like chocolate ice cream. This is my P hat. So what is the population proportion of this scenario? I need to convert this to a decimal. My population proportion is 0.4. My sample proportion we found was 29%, so that's going to be 0.29. Next. Let's um, go ahead and find the probability of selecting another sample with a sample proportion greater than the one you selected. So here we have it. My true population proportion becomes our population mean, and I have 0.29. So I'm trying to find the area to the right of 0.29. I want to find this right there. So I need to calculate a z-score. That's going to be my sample proportion minus our population proportion over the square root of P, our true population proportion, which is 0.4, times 1 minus 0.4 over our sample size, which is 45. That's going to give me negative 0.11 over 0 0.07. So I would find I have a Z value of 1.57. And remember, I don't think I bring this up often enough, that the Z score measures how many standard deviations you are away from the population mean or proportion. So 0.29 is 1.57 standard, sorry, negative 1.57 standard deviations away from 0.4. And I can use this value to look up in a Z table and find that the area over here is 0 0.06. Let's go ahead and round, 0 0.06. But I don't wanna know what's the probability of selecting a proportion less than 0.29. I wanna know the probability of selecting a proportion greater than 0.29, so I need to take 1 minus 0 0.06. That gives me 0.94. So that's the area over here. So what's the probability of selecting another sample with a sample proportion greater than the one you selected? It's gonna be 94%.
All right, last and final example. Suppose 233 out of 300 students at a school said they like nacho cheese. And let's suppose we take a simple random sample of 35 students out of the total 300 students and find that 22 of them said they like nacho cheese. What is the population proportion in this scenario? Well, to figure out the population proportion, I'm going to take 233 divided by 300. That's going to give me 0.78. And next, I'm going to take for my sample proportion, I'm going to take 22 divided by 35. And that's going to give me 0.63. So 0.78 is my true population proportion. And 0.63 is my sample proportion or P hat. Now, I want to know what is the probability of selecting another sample with a sample proportion greater than the one you selected, okay? So our true population proportion was 0.78 and my sample was 0.63. I'm gonna have to find the area over here. So we need to figure out the z-score of 0.63 and look that up in a z-table to determine the area to the left of 0.63. So I'm gonna take z to be equal 0.63 minus 0.78 divided by the square root of 0.78 times 1 minus 0.78 over the square root over, um, sorry, n, which is our sample size, right? This is little n, this is big n. Okay, that's going to give me a negative 2.14. So I go ahead, I look up negative 2.14 in the Z table, and I find 0 0.0162. But I'm not wondering what's the probability of selecting another sample with a sample proportion less than the one I selected. I need to know the probability of selecting another sample with the sample proportion greater than the one I selected. So I have to take one minus 0 0.0162. Why? Because the area under a normal curve is one. And that's gonna give me 0.98. So the area over here is 0.98. So the probability is going to be 98%.